Hello, everybody. My name is Daniel Weinstock. I have the Catherine A. Pearson Chair in uh, Civil Society and Public Policy at McGill University, and I hold appointments in uh, the Faculty of Law, the Department of Philosophy, the Max Bell School of Public Policy, and the School of Population and Global Health. As uh, that uh, self-introduction uh, probably indicates, my research over the course of the last 30 years spans a very wide range uh, of topics. Uh, but one of the areas, one of the very broad areas in which I have been involved uh, from the beginning of my career to the present day has had to do with uh, the interpretation of some of the conflicts that have beset the relationship between Quebec and the rest of Canada within the Canadian uh, Federation. Um, I should say that I'm a philosopher by training. My PhD is in philosophy. So despite the other appointments that I have, I tend to look at uh, the debates that oppose uh, people in the real world through uh, philosophical uh, tools of analysis. So I'd like to say a few words in the few minutes uh, of this video about uh, the way in which uh, I view the present state of relations between uh, Quebec and the rest of Canada from the point of view of political philosophy. It seems to me that we can divide up uh, the last 40 years or so uh, in the history of uh, Canada-Quebec relations into what is increasingly uh, apparent to me are two quite distinct historical periods. Uh, the first period, which runs from uh, about 1976 to 1995, is what one might refer to as the period of secessionist politics. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, the second period, which I think we are still very much in, uh, runs from uh, roughly the last 20 years, um, from about uh, 2000 to 2020. And I would call that the period of national affirmation. And I think that these two distinct periods um, present quite distinct political challenges and quite distinct ethic, ethical and political um, uh, challenges in terms of the analysis that we make of these real world problems that are facing um, Canadian uh, society. So uh, let me say a few words about both of these periods. Uh, in order to set up how I view uh, the state of the Canadian Federation at the present day. So in 1976, as many of you probably know, uh, somewhat to the surprise of most observers, a party devoted to the secession of Quebec from the rest of Canada was elected um, to the provincial legislator, legislature with a quite substantial majority. This party was called the Parti Québécois. And Article 1 of the Charter of the Parti Québécois was that the main goal of uh, the party, once it reached power, was to make Quebec uh, a sovereign state. Uh, to that end, uh, it um, organized a referendum on the sovereignty of Quebec uh, within its first mandate uh, in 1980. Uh, that referendum was quite uh, handily uh, defeated uh, from by, by a proportion of about 60 uh, to uh, 40. And this gave rise to a number of attempts uh, during the 1980s to amend the constitution in order to uh, satisfy Quebec's uh, claims, Quebec's uh, demands within the Canadian constitutional federal order. Uh, both of these rounds of negotiations that are referred to as the Meech Lake Round, uh, named after uh, the, the, the place where the debates uh, over uh, this round of constitutional amendments was made, and the Charlottetown Round uh, were not successful, uh, did not manage to uh, achieve a consensus within the country over the terms uh, under which Quebec could be included within the Canadian constitutional order. And uh, as a, as a Downstream result of that, another referendum was organized in 1995. Um, that referendum came within a few tens of thousands of votes of uh, achieving a yes answer uh, to the question of Quebec uh, secession. It was something like 50.1 to 49.9, something on that order. Um, 
Now, one might have thought that uh, that would pretty much uh, ensure uh, that a further referendum would be held to try to tip uh, Quebec over the edge uh, in terms of uh, securing support for a referendum. But we have not uh, seen another referendum in the last 26 years. And I think that we are now in a phase where the question of Quebec secession and the question of whether or not to organize a referendum around Quebec secession is not immediately in the cards. Now, the interesting thing about uh, the period between 1976 and 1995, so between the election of the Parti Québécois uh, and the, uh, elect the referendum defeat of 1995, was that the main philosophical and ethical issues that were being discussed and debated, both amongst politicians and uh, amongst scholars, such as myself, had to do not so much with the substantial issues uh, that might make Quebec and Canada different societies sufficiently to justify that one would secede from the other. Indeed, it was uh, recognized pretty much on both sides of the uh, uh, equation that Quebec and Canada were in many respects in terms of political culture, in terms of commitment to democratic values and so on, very similar to one another. Indeed, that they probably had more similarities uh, than, uh, difference, um, than differences. But uh, there was uh, the desire amongst many people who voted for uh, Quebec secession um, to be entirely sovereign, to be able to make, as uh, the uh, definition of sovereignty goes, all of their own laws, uh, levy all of their own taxes, and make all of their international agreements and treaties. So the terms of the debate that uh, occurred between 1976 and 90, 1995 had to do with whether secession uh, under uh, the conditions that Canada found itself in in that period was a legitimate exercise, whether Quebec could unilaterally organize uh, a referendum um, and if it were successful in uh, achieving more than 50% of the vote, um, start implementing the withdrawal of Quebec from the rest of Canada. Uh, the very deep philosophical uh, debates uh, on this question. There are some who think that it is the most fundamental democratic right that a people have to be able to decide uh, whether or not to continue uh, being part of a um, multinational federation, uh, which Canada most certainly is. Um, on the other hand, you have people who argue that um, you can't just treat uh, the decision to uh, leave a federation that has been around for in this case, over 100 years, in the same way that you would treat the decision to join it. In other words, there is um, a lot of um, uh, joint activity, uh, the production of joint capital, institutions, uh, and whatnot that have shaped the legitimate expectations of people on both sides of the divide um, that make it the case that um, it should be a lot more difficult to uh, exit a uh, federation than to uh, enter it, especially if, as is the case in uh, the Quebec Canada case, that federation is a roughly peaceful and just one, which is something that nobody really uh, denied. So I argued in some of my interventions in this debate that Quebec should not be denied uh, the right to secede, but that uh, that right should be conditioned uh, by certain, uh, well, conditions such as a super majoritarian requirement. It didn't seem to me to be uh, proper, for example, that um, Quebec be able to secede with just 50% plus one of the vote, but that perhaps a broader majority might be uh, required, a broader majority which might be an index, an indication of the intensity of feeling um, that might exist in uh, society. And other conditions, I think, are rightly put in place uh, as well. So uh, both at the level of uh, political philosophy, the debate over secession in Quebec, but also in other places similar to Quebec, like Catalonia, uh, like Flanders, uh, occupied a lot of uh, attention. Now, in uh, 1995, the second referendum was held. It was unsuccessful. Um, and for reasons which I really can't go into in this short uh, presentation, um, the question of secession fell off of the uh, political radar. It might get back on to the political radar uh, at some point in the future, but I don't foresee that it will do so uh, anytime uh, soon. 
what has occurred is a phase where I think Quebecers are um, uh, content to remain within the Canadian Federation, but only on condition that they be able to manifest in the Federation their distinctive political culture. Let me say a few words about that. I think that um, any periodization is obviously a bit of a fiction, does violence to the uh, complexity of events. But nonetheless, I think that uh, one could uh, trace the trigger of the present phase of Quebec-Canada relations to a Supreme Court decision uh, that occurred uh, about 20 years ago, which was the case of a young Sikh boy uh, who attended a school, a uh, public school in Montreal. And uh, one day, um, so many uh, Sikhs uh, carry a ritual uh, dagger called a kirpan, and uh, the boy's kirpan fell from his clothing, um, and uh, he was uh, uh, called into the principal's office and told that he couldn't carry a what looked like a weapon um, uh, in the school grounds. Uh, this case, uh, which started from a very sort of everyday kind of conflict in a particular school, made it all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada, where the Supreme Court decided uh, um, on a nine nothing majority, so a unanimous decision of the court, that under some conditions that, for example, the Kirpan be um, uh, very tightly uh, bound into the clothing so that it couldn't just fall out. Uh, there was no greater a risk to public security, to the security of children, than with uh, other uh, objects that are brought in to school on a uh, daily uh, basis, baseball bats, hockey sticks, and the like. And that uh, it should be the case that under conditions such as those that I've just uh, announced, uh, a Sikh boy should be able to wear his kirpan. Now, this uh, decision was uh, greeted in the rest of Canada with a bit of a shrug, um, nothing particularly uh, noteworthy for um, a society, rest of Canada, English Canada, that had pretty much adopted multiculturalism as one of the dominant aspects of its ideology, the idea that people in Canada should be allowed at the same time as they take part in Canadian institutions and practices to affirm certain aspects of their patrimonial uh, uh, cultures. Um, so multiculturalism very much part of Canadian uh, self-understanding, at least in English Canada. The decision was greeted with shock and horror, at least by, by some politicians and media within um, Quebec, uh, which felt or which at least used this case as a pretext to say that um, the cultural and philosophical division between Quebec and Canada uh, over multiculturalism had reached a crescendo, had reached a point uh, that really required uh, that Quebec do everything it can in order to escape, whilst remaining within the Canadian Federation, from the hold of an ideology, multiculturalism, which uh, many Quebec uh, intellectuals, uh, pundits, and politicians view as anathema to uh, Quebec culture. The debate over multiculturalism, I think in Canada, as in many other parts of the world today, is really now more a debate about um, how to deal with multi-faith uh, society than it is about multiculturalism properly understood. When one talks about multiculturalism today in Canada, and I think this is the same uh, in other places, one is talking about the question of whether and to what degree and under what conditions minority religions or religions to cool should be allowed to um, inflect and inform the public arena. Nobody anywhere uh, in liberal democracies uh, denies that uh, people ought to be able to worship as they see fit. Um, the question is to what degree their worship should or should not um, be present and public and visible in the public sphere. Uh, should people, for example, and this is a debate that has, um, that has animated a lot of our uh, political debate here in Quebec for the last uh, 10 years or so, should people be able to wear visible religious signs when they occupy certain functions within a supposedly neutral uh, public service? Uh, should police officers, uh, teachers in public schools, et cetera, be allowed to uh, present themselves as um, uh, bearers of uh, particular religious uh, identities, or should the nature of their role require that they um, 
uh, remain uh, uh, neutral with respect to uh, those identities. So uh, that is the nature of the debate between Quebec and Canada uh, that I think has been uh, central and Quebecers have made the claim that a certain way of dealing with uh, the integration of pluralism within society is as important a marker of Quebec identity as the French language is. Obviously the French language has for uh, decades uh, been one of the main uh, justifications and reasons uh, for the understanding that Quebecers have that they should be treated differently uh, than other provinces in Canada. At the beginning of the period that I'm interested in, that meant that they should have their own state. Uh, in this latter period, it has manifested itself more in the sense that it should have autonomy over the way in which it deals with issues like language and culture. Um, but uh, I think that what has been interesting is that in the last uh, little while, issues around the way in which to deal with the integration of uh, cultural diversity has been just as important uh, in the public domain as questions of language. Now, uh, the topic of the lecture that I'll be giving at uh, the University of Innsbruck in a few uh, weeks uh, has to do with uh, the way in which this debate is now uh, framed, um, uh, which has to do with uh, the different versions, the different visions, I should say, of secularism that are present in uh, Quebec uh, and in the rest of Canada. In the rest of Canada, I think you have a vision which I call a liberal vision of secularism, according to which uh, multiculturalism and secularism are perfectly compatible uh, because we should measure the secularism of our institutions not by what people wear, but by the way in which the institutions function. And um, the view, which I think is a very reasonable one, is that Canadian public institutions function in a completely neutral way, uh, in a way which takes the equal rights and interests of all citizens seriously, despite the fact that some of the people who work within those institutions or who use those institutions may be the bearers of visible identities, whether cultural or uh, religious. So uh, secularism in English Canada is, I think, uh, almost a synonym for state neutrality. And the idea is that state neutrality can be achieved um, even if uh, public officials are uh, bearers, visible bearers of religious identities. I think a different understanding of secularism um, has become dominant in Quebec, certainly dominant amongst uh, decision makers and amongst some of the leading intellectuals and pundits uh, here. Um, and that understanding is, again, I'm going to, I'm going to use a slightly uh, philosophical term, um, perfectionist rather than uh, liberal. The idea is that um, uh, religion is not, uh, secularism is not just a, 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 a something that we use in order to characterize our institutions, but it is to some degree a goal towards which we should aspire. Um, and that the state acts appropriately when it takes steps uh, to ensure that that goal uh, is uh, achieved. Uh, so on the one hand, you have English Canada, which views secularism not as a goal, but as a constraint on the way in which institutions operate, and Quebec, where I think secularism is viewed as more of an objective rather than just a set of constraints that can be put in place in the pursuit of uh, various uh, objectives. I'm not going to say too much more because um, I think uh, I have uh, more than used up the time that has been given to me, but just to say that I think we're at a very interesting point in our uh, history where the uh, national affirmation of Quebec and its desire to mark and um, accentuate its differences from the rest of Canada have really um, crystallized around uh, these different understandings of secularism. I think that anybody who's been observing the Canadian and Quebec political scene for long enough could not really have predicted that this is where we would be in 2021 from where we started off uh, with the election of the Parti Québécois in 1976. Thank you for your attention.